So how is everyone doing? Well, yeah, learning about energy and solar and all those awesome things. It's like the best thing ever. Uh, uh, my name is Tara. I'm Bear Clan from Kuchishing First Nation. I was born under the Maple Sapping Moon. Um, I think it's very important to always acknowledge the indigenous people of the lands we're on. So we're sitting in Dakota lands right now. There's Anishinaabe lands all, all around in Minnesota, um, and that's the language that you just heard. So, I am born and raised in International Falls, Minnesota, and it is very nice to be back in Minnesota. Um, I've been out in Washington, D.C. for the past four years and learning all of the lovely, lovely policies and procedures of this country and seeing the ascension of Donald Trump into the highest office. Um, yeah, I worked for, I, I wanted Bernie to win, so I'm on the exact opposite end of that spectrum. Um, we had two choices to make, and unfortunately, we did, we did the one that uh, has forced away apathy. I think we can give him that, right? I mean, yeah. Donald yeah. Trump has been the killer of apathy. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I kind of had a weird, I actually only graduated four years ago, which is crazy to think about, um, and been out in the world. I was a two-time graduate of University of Minnesota, went there for undergrad in law school. Go yeah. Gophers. And uh, I've had this weird path of going from a DC law firm and representing tribal nations around the country um, to then working with Bernie and then somehow ending up in North Dakota holding a car mat up to keep rubber bullets from hitting my body. Um, it's been a weird transition over the past few years to say the least. This last year especially was quite busy. Um, but people ask, you know, why, why this? Why this? Why the environment? Why are, you, why are you all so concerned about this? Um, you know, why are you willing to get bit by dogs and shot at in North Dakota and put in dog kennels and um, hit with water cannons and just all the madness that happens? Who's familiar with the Dakota Access Fight? Yeah. Yeah! Minnesota had an amazing, amazing presence in North Dakota, by the way. I'm very proud of our Um yeah, so people ask, you know, why? why? Why this? I grew up on Rainy Lake. You know, I grew up with a place that's pristine and beautiful, and I grew up hunting and fishing, and in later years, you know, wild ricing and being close to the environment, and close to the environment around us. Um, to me, it was never an issue of being in a city and not knowing where my water comes from, not knowing where my food comes from. Instead, it's, it's right there. Um, if, if the pipeline or the mine is right here water, it's something that it's gonna be transmitted to the fish that you're gonna eat. Um, you know, even the knowledge of the boats that we use that are on the water and seeing that oily trail behind, I always knew, you know, that we have an impact on the, on the environment around us. Um, and as I went through school at the University of Minnesota, they have this great program, it's the Ojibwe language program, um, and there's a cultural aspect to it as well. Um, Medewin is the Ojibwe uh, Medicine Society, and that has fundamentally changed my relationship with the earth around me um, and taught me so much about how big of an influence we have, both in our role in this circle of life that we're all part of, but also in the role of the next generation. So everything that we do, everything that we uh, you know, impact and, and reach out to in this world affects the next generation. The decisions that we make today affect the, the kids that are coming tomorrow. Um, you know, and that, that just, it resonated so much with me and resonated with, a lot, it has resonated with a lot of people that I'm dealing with, but also with all of these people now that I see in um, environmental organizations that are looking at indigenous people and saying, well, you guys seem like you've been, do been doing this for a while. You know, you've been living sustainably for a while. It seems like you guys maybe have some ideas. I'm like, we do have ideas. We have quite a few ideas on how to keep this environment well. Um, we understand that we're stewards, that we're not just takers, and we're not just consumers. Um, that we have to give back, right? We have to give back. And so, you know, coming from that background and then going out to Washington, D.C., um, and working on Capitol Hill and learning exactly how these processes really go um, when it comes to federal legislation, when it comes to our lawmakers and our representatives, was pretty shocking to me. I kind of had this rosy, 
version of, you know, knowing that the government was something that my parents got pissed off about occasionally and there was, you know, bad things on the news and it was whoever was in office at that time, right? Um, but then actually going out there and seeing that it, it really it was a lot of pettiness and a lot of people that were influenced directly by corporations and then voting and putting in piece of legislation that represent those corporations. You know, I actually really would love to see a Congress where our representatives have to wear like kind of like the bumper stickers, you know, like when you're like a race car driver and you have to show who's sponsoring you. I mean, look at that and then look at how they vote. You see these, these special interest groups that are there and, you know, for me as a tribal attorney, you know, I was a lobbyist in the Hill, but I was lobbying for tribes. So I was asking for hospitals and, you know, schools and, um, you know, funding for teen suicide programs and then sitting in the same room as like, you know, big oil or like the, you know, tobacco industry and just being like, I've got five minutes. I bet you guys have like an hour, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. But those are the priorities. Um, and that eventually led into, uh, you know, meeting Bernie Sanders, introducing the Keep It in the Ground Act on the Hill. Um, I was spending my, so I was, I was working in, the, in Capitol Hill and doing all this, you know, work for tribes across the nation when it came to helping out with their legal situation, but then spending my lunch breaks running over and doing Keystone protests and things like that, you know, um, and, and seeing this, you know, this complete lack of representation of both indigenous voices, but also of a true perspective of what was happening out in the country. You know, it felt like our voices were so minimal in, in the whole conversation. Um, that the people themselves were very, very minor in, in the actual representation of, of what was being decided, of the pieces of legislation that we're actually going through. And recognizing that, you know, it, was a, it wasn't until the very, very end of the session that they were actually gonna do anything. They were just gonna pass through as many bills as they possibly could. And, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're actually pretty bad for a lot of people, but we just have to pass it, right? Um, and then meeting Bernie, who was, you know, I think at that point he was like crazy Uncle Bernie in the news. So I didn't really know a lot about Bernie Sanders when I went to that conference. I was just like, oh, cool, this guy's introducing a Keep It in the Ground Act. He wants to keep fossil fuels in the ground and not let public lands be drilled, um, which is where we're at right now, right? They're opening up the national parks, or trying to. They're trying to delist national parks and create those as, hey, let's see if there's any oil in you know, Yellowstone. It's like, how could you possibly do that? Where is the, where is the American people represented in that situation? You know, you're putting our most precious places that we've kept pristine on the line for fossil fuel infrastructure. So I met this guy, this crazy guy. Um, and he really, you know, he's like really like very stern and all that, you know, and he's, he's oh yeah, it's really nice to meet you. That, that guy? <laughs> um, but ended up being looked into the campaign because at the same time, um, his, his presidential ideas and his promises were really actually catching on. People thought that somehow it wouldn't resonate with the American public to have a president that was talking about taking money out of Congress, taking influence and corporations out of Congress, um, creating a system where people's voices were actually being heard and the environment mattered. That was something that apparently made him crazy, but so many people, that, that message resounded with so many people around the nation. I mean, millions and millions of people voted for Bernie Sanders. That was incredible. Um, and it was really powerful too because his campaign was so different than something else that had happened before in terms of being grassroots. It was grassroots organizing around the country that got Bernie Sanders into where the position he was in, where he was actually at these debates with Hillary Clinton, pointing out the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party, uh, pointing out that really there weren't that many differences between Democrats and Republicans when it came to certain issues. You know, Fracking as a, as a bridge fuel, natural gas as a bridge fuel, you're talking about hydraulic fracturing and contaminating the environment and using that as, yeah, that's our solution, that's our energy solution. No, that's not our energy solution. Just transition is our energy solution. Solar is our energy solution. Wind is our energy solution. Um, you know, and so seeing, like, I mean, I would go out in these different states and go out and get to stump for Bernie, and it was, it was pretty cool. Um, there were some interesting people that came to Bernie Sanders rallies um, that had all this, you know, like a wealth of knowledge for sure. But it was, uh, you know, really inspiring to see the power of people organizing. It was people that were doing this and making this change. It was not 
a campaign machine of you know money and and lobbying ads and smear ads and all that stuff. Instead, it was just people, like a group of 20 people. I, I went to the state of Maine. It was literally 20 people that were able to get that state 80 percent of the vote for Bernie Sanders. I mean, that's incredible, right? It's incredible to see that power. Unfortunately, you know, the end, at the end of the day, I think. Personally, you know, the system won, and that was hard. But I don't really think the system won entirely, because as this crazy Uncle Bernie grassroots effort around the country showed, there was a lot of people who weren't happy with the system. They weren't happy with the status quo. They weren't happy with the way things were, and were willing to go out and organize and take a stand and do more than just march in the streets. They weren't just marching in the streets. They were knocking on doors. They were calling people. They were doing outreach. They were having meetings in their, you know, in their communities and recognizing that their community voices really mattered. Um, that it wasn't just about one presidential candidate. Instead, it was about who's in your state office, who's in your school board, who's in your city council, who is actually controlling the things that impact your daily life. It's not just one person. And that's where, you know, I look at someone like Donald Trump, and it is really hurtful to me, honestly, to see that person in office and to see some of the hurtful, hateful things that come out of, out of his mouth. And, out of his administration. However, that is just one person. One person can't break us, just like one person can't make us. It's on us to keep, keep this moving forward. And uh, you know, after after that loss, um, it was it was tough. You know, it was a it was a tough loss, but it was also, like I said, inspiring to see those people kind of really realizing their own autonomy and really having their own agency. Um, and then at that same time, like right when that campaign was done and he had to, you know, support Hillary Clinton and they tried to unify the party even though they had already so clearly shown that there was a different progressive that was wanting something different than the standard candidate. Um, at that same time, this, this pipeline struggle in North Dakota was happening um, and it was really ramping up. It had been going on for a couple years. Uh, just like here in the state of Minnesota, people have been fighting line three for years. But unfortunately, in North Dakota, even though the tribes had said no, 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 again and again, they were building it anyway. And uh, the tribe, LaDonna Allard, she's a tribal member, she went on Facebook. Facebook is an amazing tool, by the way. It allows us to have connections to each other across the world. It's amazing, incredible. Um, she went on Facebook and just asked for help. And then at the same time that she went out and asked for help, these runners ran 2,000 miles from Cannonball, North Dakota to Washington, D.C. 2,000 miles. Teenagers. Teenagers that cared. Teenagers that was, this is our community, and we said no. This is literally our future on the line. If that pipeline breaks, and pipelines always leak, that happens. There's hundreds and hundreds of leaks every year in pipelines when it comes to pipelines, and it's not just a little bit. It's not just one rail car, it is thousands and thousands of gallons in a single minute. Um, if that pipeline breaks, it will go into our drinking water and it is the sole drinking water source of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the many, many people living along the, Miss the Missouri River. 17 million people live along that river. Um, and to me, I was, it, these kids showed up, this fake call went out and it was, I have to go. I have to go and help and I have to stand with finally seeing a resistance of no, we're not gonna let this happen. We will not let you do this. We are taking a stand and we will, we're gonna put our bodies in front of the machines. We're not gonna let you do this to our lands. We're not gonna let you destroy our sacred sites. And so it turned into this resistance that started from a group of about 12 people back in April to 10,000 people in uh, late October. I mean, it was, it was a point, like I got out there in August and it was a couple teepees and a few tents and people being really excited and feeling awesome. And that turned into a community, like a whole city. It was the 14th largest city in North Dakota, which is pretty cool. 14th largest city in North Dakota. I mean, North Dakota is pretty, pretty sparse, but that was cool. That was super cool. Um, you know, I, we, were, we joke around about, you know, getting our own zip code and all that stuff because they were trying to figure out, well, where do we mail all their arrest forms to? I'm not really sure. Like, we have warrants out for them, but they're living off, I, I don't really know, they're living off the grid. Also, all this stuff that you guys are working on, that made such a big difference when you are living outdoors. When you are doing active resistance, having solar rays, 
having wind energy, having your own energy production is incredibly important to keeping those camps going. And there are camps up north right now that are, that are gearing up for line three because they know that that pipeline may, may be a real thing. It may actually happen. It's sitting in the regulatory process right now. Um, you know, Governor Dayton has been remarkably quiet about it, even as he's been holding these water summits around the state. Um, has said really nothing about line three, about taking a position against it. And, you know, they've started constructing now in Wisconsin, and they've started constructing in Canada, so they're essentially constructing around the state of Minnesota. To them, it's a done deal, right? In their minds, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna bully this through, Minnesota doesn't matter, um, you guys are gonna approve this. I actually was on a M NPR interview with one of the Enbridge reps, and um, she got asked, well, you know, what would happen if, if this pipeline isn't approved? What, 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 what would Enbridge's position be then? And she actually laughed and said, you know, I, hmm, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm really not comfortable answering that question. I really don't know. And I'm like, you have never thought about that. That is clearly not even something that's passed through your mind at all. Um, you know, this is, this is done in your heads. So I wanted to show a video um, of the Dakota Access fight. Um, I think it's, I can talk about it and I can say all the things that I personally experienced, but I think it's more important just to see it. There's really no other way to get a sense of really what happened. Uh, and this is from Unicorn Riot. Anyone? Yeah. Unicorn Riot? Yeah? All right. <laughs> Unicorn Riot camped with us for months. It was awesome. Like, so, you know, I get to see these guys shuffling around their, like, robes in the morning and then, like, you know, their little coffee and then show up and do this. <laughs> Go ahead. There's language. People are really clearly saying they're not going to get out of the way. It looks like uh, uh, the police are firing the LRAD now. It looks like the roadblock appears going up in flames. Uh, the LRAD's now going off. People are backing up. Uh, there's two LRADs from my other side. You can hear two of them going. It's really loud and really uncomfortable. People. Technical difficulty. Uh, it was a surreal situation as a indigenous person, but also just as a as a citizen, um, to be in a situation where you are demonstrating and you know exercising your constitutional rights to freely assemble and have free speech, you know, exercise free speech and being brutally assaulted by the police officers. I mean, I saw teenage girls getting maced at point blank range. Um, mace can kill you if you're hit that closely. And I mean, it's, we're talking like right here. Um, I almost got shot that day. There was a guy that saw me. Um, I had been questioning the police officers who were all lined up and looking at us with their guns and like behind their masks. Um, I asked them, you know, I signed up, to, I'm a lawyer, right? I, I swore an, an oath to uphold the laws of this country and to, um, you know, ensure that the laws of this country protect the citizens. What are you doing? Are you protecting citizens right now? Are you protecting a pipeline? And I could see like their heads start to get like really shamed, right? Like they were very ashamed of what they were doing. And one guy saw that and he like immediately took aim like right in my face and pulled the trigger, right? And someone, someone saw that right as he did that and pulled me back and it exploded like right next to my head. I mean, if that had hit me in the face, I would have been very, very seriously injured. Um, it was a situation where I, I was seeing in real time the interest of profits and the protection of profits over the protection of human beings. Um, the human beings were, the human beings who were trying to protect the drinking water and their drinking water and the land uh, for everyone, including the, the sons and daughters of the police officers. Um, and including the sons and daughters of Energy Transfer Partners and of Dakota Access Pipeline and all the people that are involved in that, um, were being outright assaulted for, for taking a stand and for trying to stop the destruction of a sacred site that was, I mean, it was where that access sign is right now. It was that close, watching and knowing that a sacred site was being destroyed. And that's not just a sacred site to indigenous people, it's a sacred site for everyone, right? This is our shared collective history. Um, these, these places are shared and they're, they, once they're gone, they're gone. There's, there's no coming back after that. Um, you know, I, I think I, I definitely learned a lot about um, corruption out in DC, but then I saw a lot of corruption in real time when I was fighting on a front line. 
And that's something I'm really, really hoping does not happen in the state of Minnesota. Because if this pipeline project, line three, um, is sent through the treaty territories and wild rice and the headwaters of the Mississippi River and to the shores of Lake Superior, there's gonna be incredible, incredible resistance. There already is incredible, incredible resistance. I mean, there's, there's multiple camps of people right now that are, that are standing there, that are, that are making a stand. Um, so if any of you want to take your skill sets of building amazing things up, up north, there's people that could definitely use your help because it's starting to get cold. Um, but, you know, it's, you come to this point of, okay, so obviously there's a lot of problems and I'm one of the people that fights against the problem, right? So I'm, I'm trying to fight against the expansion of fossil fuels. I'm trying to fight to protect the environment for future generations. But there has to be solutions too. And that's where renewable energy comes in. It's almost like beating your head against a brick wall, right? Like you're having these conversations with big oil and you're having these conversations with banks and with investors and all these different people. And you're, you're going over the nitty gritty of, you know, building a pipeline and they're looking at you, well, no, we want energy. We want energy. I'm like, we have energy solutions that don't contaminate rivers. We have energy solutions that don't kill rivers when they spill into them. I mean, look at the Kalamazoo River. Kalamazoo River, that was over a million gallons of tar sands that spilled into that river by the Enbridge Corporation. Million gallons. That river is still being cleaned up. And that's what they want to send to the headwaters of the Mississippi River. You know, that's what we're looking at. And it's a situation where, okay, Energy East just got, su just got suspended, potentially forever. That's amazing, incredible. That's a win over Canada. Um, The, you know, the, the Kinder Morgan pipeline is receiving this incredible amount of pushback and resistance. They're building tiny homes in the path of the pipeline. That's incredible. <laughs> um, and now we've got like what's left, which is Keystone and Line 3, you know, and Line 3 is Enbridge's single largest project in history. It's the single largest project in the history of their company, and that's what they are putting all their eggs into. So imagine if we are able to defeat this pipeline and defeat this project. Imagine if they have to turn tail and go home. You know, this is Canadian oil. It's not, it's not their citizens that are going to bear the risk. It's ours. Um, it's our citizens that have to worry about that pipeline breaking and walking through your field and smelling oil and realizing tar sands are now laying on, on top of your field. Um, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting situation to see indigenous communities who are some of the poorest in resources and some of the... Uh, most invisibilized and not heard um, that are out in front of this, that are the ones trying to lead the charge, that are the ones who are leading the charge. You know, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline did get built, but along the way, we cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. And in the divestment efforts that we've been doing, which I will continue to do, what a lot of us are doing, we've cost them billions of dollars, billions. To the point that I've now had to see Kelsey Warren, the, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners, uh, painting himself as a victim. Yeah. Saying that, you know, the environmental groups and the Indians targeted him and they told a bunch of lies and it's really safe and they, they don't know, you know, they actually, he actually alleged, they're suing us too, by the way, they're suing all these environmental organizations that uh, tried to stop this pipeline in North Dakota. Um, because of the damage that was caused, right? And because of us now looking at, okay, so you guys don't care, obviously you have no souls, so we're gonna go to the banks because our money is the one who's in the banks, right? Like we are consumers, this is like our money that you're actually out investing, so we should have a say in it. They listen to us, the banks really don't like us showing up. You know, we show up at Wells Fargo and we're rallying right in their front entryway. They're like, not happy to see us, right? Not happy to see us at all. And then if we show up with y'all and y'all are saying, hey, you know what, here's a great solution. Look at this, we could do this instead. That's, you know, that is both resistance and transition happening at the same time. The problem and the solution. Um, I really hope that we come together and continue to stick together. So, um, I wanted to, you know, leave with one piece and then hear from you guys, because talking is talking, but, um, you know, I think, there is power in the earth, there's power in the water, and there's power in the sky, and there's power in each other. 
And so, you know, run for office or run a protest or run to break the system apart. You know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, it's all good, right? Um, because we're all fighting for the next generation, we are all in this together. And together we are powerful and it's people that, that make a difference. So, co op, you glitch. Thank you, Tara, and thank you, everybody. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you very much. So we're going to take a few questions. Anybody have any immediate questions for Tara? Let's just shoot. You could come over here, or actually, go ahead, go ahead and shout your question out. About um, the fact that we had um, President Obama in there for eight years. Um, this was at the very end of his second term, um, where things really came to a head. Can you sort of enlighten us into his role and how we ended up, where we ended up with the pipeline? I'm just going to read the question for you. The question was basically, after we had Obama for eight years, just kind of figure out the role where we are today. And you're asking specifically with his, him being in office during the Dakota Access Pipeline Resistance? Yeah, so that's... Yes. And before, yeah, no, so, okay, so my first internship in Washington, D.C. Um, was actually in the White House. It was in the Council on Environmental Quality. It was 2011, so Obama was in office. At that time, we were working on a Keystone, right? And Keystone was this resistance that happened for seven years. People just arrest after arrest in like, this escalated situation, all these lawsuits, landowners filing lawsuits. Um, I think there was a perception that Obama was a, because he was a liberal, he was a environmentally conscious president. And from my perspective, I don't think that's entirely true. I think that he made a point of putting people into environmental positions that were environmental focused. Um, he, did, he certainly didn't put in the CEO of Exxon into you know, a, a high level department, unlike some people. Um, you know, also didn't set out to dismantle the EPA. Um, you know, I think that he, when it came to the environment, it seemed like that was one of the things that was maybe on the chopping block when it came to negotiations and stuff like that. Um, it was really, really hard. I, from working in the White House um, on environmental issues to then being in the Dakota Access Pipeline fight and realizing that we were literally at the point of someone potentially being killed. Um, you know, someone had lost their eyesight in one eye from being shot at, and we had um, a woman who almost lost her arm. Uh, Sophia Wolanski had her arm almost blown off by a concussion grenade. Uh, you know, I, I had friends that were walking around with holes in their legs. I mean, skin grafts, like the whole thing. And Obama didn't say anything. Like, it was, it was horrible, you know? I mean, it was, I, at first I thought, okay, maybe it's because Hillary Clinton is running and she's pro-fracking, so he's gonna stay out of it. But then she didn't win and he still didn't say anything. And it got colder and it got worse. And it got, it got so bad that it was to the point where I, I literally thought someone was gonna lose their life. Um, and it, it terrified me thinking about that happening. Um, and nothing, he, he said nothing. It wasn't until the veterans showed up, about 2,000 veterans showed up and it was the veterans versus the police and I don't think that he wanted to see that as his send off um, his last days in office. So I would say, you know, I think that we had someone in office that was supportive of the environment, but at the same time, um, we definitely still had a politician in office and it was not one of his top priorities. Thanks, Sarah. Anybody else? Uh, yes, General Senegal. This isn't the first time we've had arguments about water in Missouri. Uh, my daughter lives on at White Shield, the Garrison Dam, and that was a big battle too, where they, we, we, they, they lost the battle and, and the and native land was flooded. But uh, what comes of this is there's been a lot of smart indigenous lawyers like yourself fighting for native rights. They're called Coyote Warriors. There was a book called Coyote Warriors, a great book. I'm wondering, are there more of you? God bless you. <laughs> we all hope so, right? 
Um, so yeah, you know, that's actually, so the other part of what I do is this thing called Not Your Mascots, and it's about, you know, one, the Washington football team, but also about just representations of Native American people generally. Um, it's surprising to me that even in Washington, D.C., which is pretty intelligent people for the most part, I mean, maybe not now these days, but for the, for the most part, right? Um, but still getting those questions of, man, you're an attorney, really? You guys are attorneys now? And I'm just like, Indians are everything. Like, we're also doctors and lawyers and teachers, and like, we're all over the place. We're everywhere, right? <laughs> we even live in houses these days. It's crazy. Like, 2017 happened, and you know, yeah. Or my teepee has Wi Fi in it. You know, I tell them things like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? Um, Yes, there, there, are, there are quite a few indigenous attorneys. Um, we always need more people, we always need more attorneys, but we also need people that are non-indigenous too. I mean, it's everyone. This is, the water and the land is all of us. It's all of our future, that's on, that's it. Thank you, anybody else? Are Senator Klobuchar and Franklin, Franken, are they allies, would you say, or maybe not so much? Um, so I would say, you know, I, I did see that uh, this gentleman right here, actually, Mr. Robert Pilot, uh, questioned Senator Klobuchar directly about Line 3 and about Indigenous rights. Um, and she did a pretty good sidestep, I thought. You know, she talked about jobs and she talked about not having, not hearing really any pushback um, on this particular issue. Um, so I think that's a crock. And I think we should maybe push back even more just to remind her that, yes, we actually do care a lot. Um, Franken, I think, I, I think he can be pushed a lot more, right? Um, you know, he's got a long history of uh, having really strong support for indigenous rights. He actually came out against Dakota Access Pipeline, was very much opposed to that. Um, I'm actually working really hard with his office to try and get, it's gonna, there's gonna be a thing that's circulated. Uh, we're setting the date for it, but it's gonna be a call your senator day, and it's particularly call Franken. Um, if we can push him over, to calling Governor Dayton, maybe we'll get actually a public stand against line three. Like that would be incredible to have. Excellent. Follow up to the last question. I'm from Wisconsin, so uh, did you get any help from any of the congressional delegation from Wisconsin? I know Ron Johnson's a absolute zero in solos, Paul Ryan and <laughs> You know, we've got plenty of zeros in Wisconsin now, but hopefully we have somebody that helped out. Is yeah, there kinda, anybody? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of wondering what's going on in Wisconsin, because Wisconsin's a really pretty state. You know, it's really green, it's got beautiful hills, and it makes a lot of cheese, and it's got a lot of lakes, too. And I'm like, how are these guys coming out of that state? Seriously? Paul Ryan? Like, come on. That guy's terrible. Like, sorry, but that guy's terrible. Um, I really haven't done a lot of organizing with the congressional members in Wisconsin, but I'm assuming because I actually will be moving back to Duluth very shortly to fight line three on the ground. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Coming, coming to a, coming to a jail near you. It's gonna, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I probably will be learning a lot more about the Wisconsin. Uh, you know, political structure and what they got going on over there. It's, it's a tough state, for sure. It's very red. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Pini Gigi, <laughs> Tara, for all you do. This is Robert Pilot. Uh, the one thing that I just want to mention, too, about Amy Klobuchar is that there's an old native saying, the left wing and the right wing are from the same bird. And that's what I got. She sounded very Republican when I talked to her. Yes, thank you. Um, anybody else? Hi, first of all, thank you for your speech. That was very inspirational. And um, thank you. my question is for us out here who want to learn more, um, where is the best place to get educated and learn the facts about what you talked about today? Sure. Um, so there's actually a specific campaign page just for Line 3. It's called stoplinethree.org. Um, I work for Honor the Earth. It's, you can go to honorearth.org. Um, and Honor the Earth, we, we uh, it support struggles all over the United States and all, uh, you know, I mean, it's these issues that I'm talking about, you know, specifically why are, 
Why are indigenous people so tied to this? Because indigenous communities are the ones that, in, that bear the brunt of this. Uh, when it comes to fossil fuel extraction and climate change, it's first and worst indigenous communities because it happens somewhere else. It doesn't happen in cities, it doesn't happen in suburbs, it doesn't happen where people can see it, it's somewhere, somewhere else. And that's usually reservations and it's public land. Um, and that's where you see, who ever heard of Cannonball, North Dakota, you know? But Cannonball, North Dakota became really well known because it, because it was right next to the pipeline route. Um, you know, and now we're gonna be looking at, you know, White Earth, Minnesota, you know, these places, Fond du Lac, people don't know, these are small little places, right? But we know them. And this is, these are our links, right, that are, that are, at, that are at stake. Um, so I would recommend those two websites to at least learn a little bit more about this particular fight, but um, Honor Earth has a lot more about just generally, like what's going on out there. Um, and I'm sure you guys have got some great resources about sustainability and you know, renewables, our solutions at this as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for speaking. Are there some specific uh, Line 3 events and uh, actions coming up that you want to highlight? September 28th, go to the public hearing. Please go to the public hearing, seriously. Um, the hearing will be at the Intercontinental Hotel in St. Paul at 6 p.m. There's also one at 1 o'clock. Uh, you got two chances to go and talk to the regulators and tell them why you're concerned about this going through their lakes and through their drink and through your drinking water, through your watersheds. Um, please go to that. September 28th. Okay. Very important. A big rally in between at 4 o'clock. Yeah, that'll be fun. You get all like fired up and then you can go, go tell them how you feel. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you. Who's next? This is another advisory board member, by the way. Hi. Um, this question is actually kind of for my son, who wasn't able to be here. Um, but would you have any thoughts after being in DC and kind of seeing this whole like representational, non-representational government occurring? We're kind of in a place where there's a lot of divisiveness being built up by the media and by, you know, almost everywhere you go, it's like us versus them. And it's just getting worse and worse. And the problem is, what do we do when half of the country is them? I mean, that's a lot of people, you know? And so just fighting and winning doesn't seem to be the, a viable answer, totally. So do you have any, any comments about how to open up conversations with people who don't share your views? I work with people all the time that think that I'm insane, right? So, <laughs> people that do not agree with me whatsoever. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to meet people where they're at. You know, people come from whatever set of facts, and uh, maybe, maybe not always facts, but you know, versions of facts, um, but also just a perspective, right? And, and the immediate situation around them. And so, you know, when you're talking with someone that is standing on the completely opposite side of the room from you and they cannot agree on pretty much anything, um, I think it's, it's important to just kind of open your mind a little bit more, even if their mind is really closed, um, and try to understand, you know, why, are, why do they feel this way? And maybe you won't come to an agreement, but I think it's, there is a lot of division that's happening and it's, it's become very apparent, right? Like, I think that, especially from the media, we see this categorization of people. So it's, you know, um, it's, it's Black Lives Matter, it's Antifa, it's, uh, you know, the KKK, it's, well, those guys do stand on their own, they're <sighs> crazy, but, you know, there's all these different segregate, like, just little silos, right? And we end up working in silos, too. So there's the environmentalists working in one group, there's the indigenous peoples working in another, there's the black African Americans working in another. You know, it's, it's we all divide ourselves up. Um, but I think what I see that's really effective is community organizing. So locally, not just looking at the national level, but looking locally, you know, having a rally like this, you know, it's, it's really powerful. You're gonna have all these people coming out that are from all different walks of life, from different communities that are here for a united issue, right? Um, I think you can, if you can tolerate most people, you can, you can have a conversation with them. 
Um, if you can keep your mind open and your heart open and just try to see them as people, it can be really helpful. But sometimes, you know, you do have to walk away. Um, I definitely have some, you know, conversations at the Thanksgiving table where I'm like, oh my goodness, okay. Um, I'm gonna walk away from this one. Not gonna, not gonna reach you, but that stuffing is great, right? <laughs> Excellent. We have another one right over here. Anybody? Yes. Uh, my name is Maggie Kozak, and I just had a response for the last one. I recently made a friend who was a Republican. I'm a big Woo! liberal. And I was like, oh my God. And I was totally freaked out. And my friend has brought to my attention that I, as a liberal, can be really alienating. And I don't do a very good job of recruiting people to, quote unquote, my side. And those signs we have aware that say, like, everyone welcome, I'm like, does that include Republicans? Am I included Republicans? And it's just kind of opened my eyes to, like, you know, I should try to be nicer about it so that I can be more convincing. And this friend and I have continued for months, and he recently admitted to me that, like, I've actually helped change his mind because I've told him things that he didn't know about because he was listening to fake news. Um, and so I think... The more that we can try to be tolerant and the more that we can try to recognize that someone's a human and try not to attack them and have those conversations, even though they can be uncomfortable and build up that trust, the more that we can get people to agree with us and go, you're right, this guy Trump, we should get him out of here. So <laughs> thank you so much for your talk and for going to Dakota Pipeline when some of us are too chicken or make excuses and don't go. So thank you so much for all of your work. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else? Let's go to the thick one right here. Hello. I heard someone say tonight that um, half of the people are with us and half aren't. And actually, I think that is not quite accurate. I think many more people are with us than are not. Um, I saw one polling about 56%, and I thought, it, I think it's probably low. And um, I, I wonder if you'd say something about, it seems like we need to just full on say what we want, say what we believe is the best thing like you've been doing tonight for the land, the water, the country, all the people without rage. Yeah. You know, I actually, um, that, that makes me think. So you are fundamentally opposite sides, right, of the table. What's it like to have a conversation with someone like that? So when I was arrested, and I was on the side of the road in zip ties, um, one of the police officers was horrible. He was, you know, trying to say all this stuff, like, you're never going to get your car back, you're going to be in jail for the next, like, six weeks, you know, all this stuff to, like, all the people that were arrested. I'm like, none of that's true. And he's like, how would you know? And I go, because I'm a licensed attorney. And he walks away. He was really mad, right? Um... But then this other guy came up who was like a local police officer, right? Because that was a thing. North Dakota, they had to bring in police officers from out of state because it was police officers that would have been in a situation of beating up their neighbors, right? Like that's a very uncomfortable situation. And also the knowledge that this is their kids drinking water too. Um, and so the, the next guy that had the conversation with me was a local police officer. And he was, you know, he came over and he was like, all right, I have a conversation with you. Like, you know, just talk. And I was like, in my handcuffs, I'm like, well, I have nothing else to do at this moment. Um, but no, he, he was like, you know, I, I don't understand. Why would someone like you, why would an attorney do this? Like, why are you here? Why would you get arrested like this? This is stupid, you know? And I uh, asked him, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, why do, you, why do you think that? And he's like, well, let me guess. You're from California and you're some liberal, right? And I was like, no, I'm from International Falls, Minnesota. And he goes, wow, I fish over there all the time. I go fishing over there. And so then we started talking about fishing, right? And then we started going in the conversation of, well, do you know what hydraulic fracturing is? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, you know those big oil derricks? You know, they're, they're, they're pushing a bunch of chemicals into the ground. And like, have you noticed that the lakes up north maybe aren't as clean? And he's like, oh yeah, my son and I, we can't go fishing up there. The fish, you can't eat those. And I was like, okay, well, that's what these people are concerned about. They're concerned about contaminating these lakes. And then I could just see like the wheels like slowly turning, like, oh my goodness, maybe you guys are talking about water and maybe this actually would impact me and my son and our ability to fish. And so just reaching them as a human and, you know, at that point he was like, kind of, I could, I could see he kind of maybe felt a little bit bad about me being arrested, but. 
and she was nicer to me after that, but yeah. So that's a moment of meeting someone where they're at, for sure. Thank you, we just got time for just a couple more. I will take you. Hi, thanks for thanks so much for the work that you do and, and coming to speak with us. Um, I'm wondering about the topic of like indigenous resistance to fossil fuel development. Uh, if there has been any like collaboration or communication with uh, communities uh, north of our border in, in Canada, since this is where you know the, 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 the tar sands are operating from. Absolutely, and so I'm actually from a First Nation. So I'm from um, Kuching First Nation, which is on the other side of Rain Lake. Um, I've actually got a bunch of family that's over here, also from Kuching. Yeah. Um, shout out to the Breers and the Houskas. Um So you know, yeah, that's that's really a, an important piece that I think can often get lost of fighting all these different pipelines. We're fighting Dakota Access, we're fighting Line 3, we're fighting Keystone, we're fighting Energies, we're fighting Kinder Morgan. At the end of the day, it's about the source. So it comes from the Bakken and it comes from the tar sands in Alberta. You know, and the, and the tar sands in Alberta, those are tiny little communities that are so, so horribly impacted by this. We're talking, you know, cancer rates that are out of control, people dying at the age of 30 from cancer, like tons and tons of people in these little places. Um, so we've been, I've been personally trying to do a lot of collaboration as much as I can up north. I've been going up to Treaty 3 where I'm from. Um, I've gone up there a couple times this summer and, you know, working with organizers that are desperately trying to get resources and attention to stop it at the source. Always keeping that messaging in all of our work is really, really important to stop it at the source because there is a community up there and uh, several communities up there and they are desperately, desperately impacted by this and it's really terrible. Um, so yeah. I mean, there's definitely collaboration. We have to acknowledge it's a colonial border, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, cool. We have time for two more questions. Oh, I'm going to take you. most beautiful parts of Standing Rock, right? There was this really, really difficult situation going on where you were going out and seeing incredible violence done on other human beings, and that was really hard. But the only reason that we were able to keep doing that was because we were in prayer. And there were hundreds of communities, I mean, hundreds of nations that came together and shared culture, prayer, food, um, knowledge, traditional knowledge together. That was like one of the best parts is being in this community where so many different nations were around you and you could participate in ceremony that you wouldn't normally get a chance to experience. You know, you could go hang out with uh, the Diné people, you could go talk to Pueblo people, you could talk to, uh, you know, Six Nations Mohawk people. There were so many different nations that were together in that situation. Um, that was what kept us going. That grounding is what keeps me going. You know, I like I said, Ojibwe Medicine Society Medewin is what keeps all of the work I do grounded. Um, it's something that flows through my relationship to the earth and to the water around me um, because it's it's actually my cultural responsibility. Um, women are water keepers in Ojibwe, in Ojibwe culture. That is, we are keepers of the water and men are keepers of the fire. So it is actually my cultural responsibility to take care of the water. Um, and when you have the knowledge of something like that, that women have this role and are fundamentally connected to the water of the earth, just like the water within our bodies and within our um, wombs, that it keeps you going. That, that part is beautiful and it keeps you going. Excellent. So we've got one more question. Sorry, guys. Thank you, Ms. Tara, for all that you do. Um, I just want to flip that whole last conversation around a little bit. And could you talk about the impact of being arrested and um, some of us are chicken about being arrested, honestly. And um, so what's the professional impact of being arrested for something like this? Um, you know, it's, <laughs> yes. I could give you the, the know your rights training. So we did a lot of those, which is you don't have to talk to police officers. Uh, you do have the right to remain silent. And um, you know, it's, one of the things that I'm really hoping doesn't happen is a situation like North Dakota in Minnesota. 
I don't want to see human beings in dog kennels in Minnesota or uh, you know, water cannons being used on human beings in below freezing temperatures. And that's not acceptable. It should have never happened, and it did. Um, and it was interesting to me as I was talking to my family back home because they didn't really, they saw little clips of it on the news, but it really wasn't a, a full story. Um, it was Facebook that told them the truth. Like, my mom would see Facebook and she's like, that isn't what I saw on the news at all. You know, I saw, it, it looked like you guys were being violent. I was like, no, that was not the situation at all. Um, you know, I think spiritually it's, it's a difficult, it was, not a, it was not a fun situation for sure. Um, it was very dehumanizing. Um, it was a moment that I, or a situation I definitely will never forget. Um, being kenneled with a bunch of other women. And we did have one positive moment. We made a silver lining out of it. So they actually put like pictures of dogs up on the walls. Like, and it was like, it was really bad, right? Like we were in these big kennels together. Um, and so then we started barking like dogs. Like all of us did. We were all just howling at the top of our lungs and the police officers, shut up. And we're like, you're treating us like dogs, so we're gonna act like dogs. I'm just saying, you know, like, yeah, that's what we did, so. Uh, professionally, I guess, I, I hope the Minnesota Bar Association doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't get too pissed off at me. Um, you know, I haven't, I actually, my, my, my case was delayed out to November, or December, actually, this year. So a whole year I have to wait for getting charged with trespass while getting into my car on a public road, so. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Let's give a big energy for a thank you to Tara Halsker. Thank you very much.